very common and, and very likely. And again, religion, it was illegal for slaves in the quarters to hold their own religious services. Um, white Virginians wanted enslaved Afri African Americans to be Christian, but not outside of white supervision. And so technically, legally, it was, it was illegal for a black minister or a black um, preacher to work with a black congregation without whites present. No doubt it happened, though. The, we know for a fact there were a number of um, black preachers in this area, including at least one who performed weddings at, at solitude uh, during this period. And so there were probably illegal uh, religious ceremonies in the quarters as well, though at least 10 of the Preston slaves were officially members of the Methodist Church in town. Um, mo like most of the churches in town, it was biracial, but not equal. The, all these church, most of these churches had gall galleries in the back that the African, African Americans would sit in the back, or if there weren't room, if, if there weren't places inside, they'd sit outside and listen through the windows. Um, but there were a number of the, of the people from here. So the religion was also a community for members of this, of this African American population here. Uh, they relied on family, they relied on one another to help themselves deal with the, the oppression that was part of their, just their daily lives. Um, again, I want to just emphasize all, one of, the, one of the tragedies that they were dealing with and that the family and community helped with is the extreme fragility of all their connections. I mean, these are people who, in many cases, had been together, their parents had been together, their grandparents had been together, but at any moment, they could be sent 100 miles, 200 miles, 300 miles away, or, or further. Um, the Prestons, William, William Preston did buy and sell slaves extensively. Subsequent generations did buy, sell, did buy slaves, did sell slaves, but they do not seem to have done it in the numbers that William Preston did. So the, the, the likelihood of their family, their community being broken up probably did decline between 1800 and 1860, but it was still there. It was always a very real possibility, and as I said, on at least three occasions during that period, it was a reality that families and communities were divided. Um, just to add to that, yeah. they're doing a great job. I'm like, I'm not going to have to follow this up no. at all. Um, but, no, but just to add to that, there's evidence of preparation for that fact uh, within the families. Like, for example, uh, after the Civil War, you almost see a migration of fractions coming from different places back yep. to this area, back to Roto. Um, so when we've been finding other descendants, we'll follow their great-grandparent, and they're almost always go back to this area somewhere, Roanoke, yep. or the different counties. So it's almost like there was a folklore amongst the family that if this is ever over, or if you can ever get away, <laughs> go back to Roanoke. Well, because it, after the Civil War, it's this great migration back to Roanoke. And, and, and the fractions weren't in Henry County, but the McNortons did the same thing. The, yeah. the McNortons were, had been Roanoke. divided uh, in, in the 1840s, and as soon as slavery ended, most of the McNortons and the Moons came back from Henry County, back, this is where family was, this was home. Um, I wish I knew more about escapes from Smithfield. There, there were undoubtedly more than I'm aware of. Um, the only ones I can actually document are, there are four that we know of, all came late in the history of enslavement here. Three of the Fraction brothers, um, Oscar Fraction, who was the eldest, Thomas Fraction, and Othello Fraction. All, Thomas and Othello ran away during the Civil War, uh, probably in, in, in early 1865 and, and went out with the Union Army. Oscar may have left in 1864 when the Union Army came through, but I think he actually ran away earlier. Um, Oscar, when he joined the Union Army, he was living already in Ohio. And so I suspect he ran, and he, he doesn't show up in one of, one of the best records I have for knowing who's where is Harvey Black, the family, you know, Black, the Black family from Blacksburg is named. Harvey Black was a doctor who was uh, under contract to handle all of the medical needs of Greater Smithfield 
from the early 1850s until he joined the Confederate Army in 1861. And he kept a meticulous records of every visit to the plantation. And he identifies who he's seeing, whether it's in the big house or in the slave quarters. And so Oscar doesn't show up in Black's records after the late 1850s. And so I, I can't prove it, but I think Oscar probably ran away just before the Civil War uh, and escaped to Ohio and was living in Ohio as a free man uh, when the war came. And he doesn't come back either. No, like, he didn't like come he back. he may have came back to came Roanoke, to visit. right? He comes to visit during the Great Migration back yeah. to Roanoke, but apparently they couldn't convince them or pay him to <laughs> uh, move back here. So he lived and died in Kent, Ohio. Yep. Um, the, let me just say, I, I want to add, say a little bit about the post-war. Um, after the war, most of the enslaved stayed for a year or two. And it's not surprising. Um, legally, slaves owned no property. And so these people were suddenly told, okay, you're free, good luck. They had probably the clothing on their backs, the household possessions, maybe the furniture or the, the, the implements for cooking dinner uh, around the house. That was it. Um, they, knew how, they, they were very good farmers. Uh, at least one, William Poindexter, was a blacksmith. Tradition is that there were also, well, there had to have been people who were carpenters because they built the buildings. And family tradition is that at least some of the furniture was made by enslaved. So they had skills, but none of them owned any tools. They owned no land. They had no money in the bank. And just as important, remember, this is a world where Facebook doesn't exist, credit cards don't exist, if you needed a loan, you know, you're a farmer, you're not going to get a harvest for three months. You need food now. You get loans from people who know you. And so most of the enslaved had to stay where they could make a living. This is also where their family was. Their family was buried out here. Um, we've not yet been able to locate the, the, great, the, the cemeteries of the enslaved. But they've been here for almost 100 years. Uh, they, multiple generations had died here and were buried here. This was home to them. And so they were, they, there was no great, oh, we're free, let's leave immediately. Uh, the idea was, we're free, now we've got to survive somehow. And they continued to rely on the same family, the same community. Uh, in the years after the Civil War, I find members of the Fraction family hiring McNortons to build their houses in Roanoke. Um, members of the Moon family living with members of the McNaughton family. The, the, the community, these are the people they knew and trusted. And these are the people that they worked with to build a new life. Some, for some it was easier than others. The Fractions had probably the hardest time. Kira, do you want to tell your story or shall I? Go for it. Okay. Yeah, a good time. <laughs> Thomas and a fellow Fraction had joined the Union Army. And their owner had clearly stated that if any of his slaves joined the army and came back, he'd kill them. Well, Thomas and Othello heard that when they were in Tennessee with the army, but they also heard that the Prestons were trying to evict their father. And so they wrote a, back, they wrote a letter back saying, we're coming home, and we're not going to idly stand by and have you kill us. So they came back. They were visiting their father. Robert Preston, uh, over at Solitude, heard they were home. And so he, he and his son-in-law, two Confederate veterans, grabbed their guns, went towards the, the Fraction family home. Thomas and Othello were warned they're coming. They didn't want a conflict. So, OK, fine, we'll start leaving. And as they started to leave, Preston and Means arrived. Each side blamed the other for shooting first. You know, we don't know who fired the first shot. All we know is that probably about a dozen shots were fired. Uh, one of the Fraction brothers was wounded, uh, shot in the leg. And they were both arrested and hauled off to uh, Salem and put in jail for attempted murder. Uh, they were held in jail for about three months. The army investigated and said, no, this was self-defense. This isn't murder. Uh, they were turned loose, mustered out of the army, came back now as uh, freemen, former soldiers, 
to try and establish themselves in the, in the area they knew. Uh, again, Preston had them arrested for murder. Uh, this time, they, were, they weren't jailed for long this time. Uh, the judge, they, they were allowed to pay bail, and when they came before the court for trial, the judge threw it out immediately. He said, they've already been tried. They've been found innocent. You can't try a man twice for the same crime. They were uh, they're thrown out. Meanwhile, they tried to go to church one Sunday. Uh, the, the, I don't know that Thomas and Othello were members of the church. Uh, their, their parents were members of the Methodist church. And so the whole family was going off to church one Sunday, right there, right there in downtown Blacksburg. And Robert Preston met them at the door of the church holding a gun and said, this is my church. We can't worship here together. And the fractions said, OK. And like most, most of the African-American members of the Methodist church at that point had pulled out of the church and were uh, probably among the founders of the AME church here in Blacksburg. At that point, most of the fractions had had enough, and they moved down to Salem uh, in Roanoke County, and then ultimately on, some of them on to Baltimore. One member of the fraction family did stay, uh, Virginia Fraction. She was at Whitethorn. And from everything I can tell of the fraction, of, of the Preston plantation owners, those at Whitethorn were the least unpleasant. Um, you gotta be careful about how we say it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I, you know, I, I never want to get the impression that slavery was nice, that people enjoyed this. But there does seem to have been a genuine connection between Virginia Fraction um, and, or Virginia Fraction Caperton, uh, she married over there, Virginia Fraction and Sarah um, Preston, the, the, the mistress at, at Whitethorn. They were both widowed. Uh, in, in, in the early 1860s, both had young children, and they seemed to have formed a genuine bond because after emancipation, Virginia Fraction stayed at Whitethorn until she died you know, in the 1890s. And when she did die, two of her grandchildren were living with her. And in her will, she asked the Preston, Sarah Preston, to, plead, to, to watch, to, to take care of them, uh, to serve as their guardian. So. That at least one small part of the Fraction family seems to have had a better relationship. But most of the, most of the Fractions left. The other families initially, the first generation, the McNortons, the Saunders, the Moons, all stayed in Montgomery County. Uh, became landowners, became carpenters, became voters, became um, solid citizens of the county. Their children then began migrating out rapidly. So it's, it's the generation that was either young children when slavery ended or were born after the end of slavery began migrating literally all over the country. Uh, McNortons went to Texas, to Southern California, to uh, Montana. Moons went to um, elsewhere in Virginia, went many of them up, up into West Virginia to the coal mines. Um, fractions went to Baltimore. One of, the, the, the Fractions and the McNortons intermarried. So the, one of the, 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 the families out in Montana are a combination of, of McNortons and Fractions. Um, they've, scat, they've, they've moved completely around. This is the great thing, meeting Kira has allowed me to identify dozens of descendants I could never find as a traditional historian looking through the documents. Um, and we've got a total now, how many hundred do we have? Do you identify? Uh, probably like 180. Okay. Some more has popped up last week. So oh, we'll see how it goes. Where are they? Uh, I'm not sure. Yet. Okay, right. Sure. Yes. But and well, he got excited. He's like, "Forget y'all, let's go." Right. So we're, <laughs> we're still we're still working on how they're all inter interconnected, because as Kira mentioned, some of the fraction descendants, for example, came out of Abingdon. Unfortunately, I've ne we've not yet been able to figure out who went from here to Abingdon. Um, the name is so unusual that it clearly had to be members of the same family. And we know when William Preston died, he wrote in his will that as each of his sons came of age, he should be given some enslaved workers. And when each of his daughters married, she should be given some enslaved workers. And one of his daughters married a cousin down in Abingdon about 1804, 1805. And I'm positive that some of the some of the enslaved workers she uh, she received were members of the fraction family, but unfortunately nobody recorded who they were. 
uh, and I haven't been able haven't been able yet to, to con so we've got the present and the past and there's a bit in the middle that that, that we can't that we can't figure out yet yeah. so we're still working on it yeah like this new new fraction that popped up he still has the last name fraction oh yes and he said you know I just was looking around and then I came across this book and then I came across this group because we started a group and he was like who are we <laughs> like and I see like that's the message and. Um, Eva Jane, the newest yeah. midnight, yeah. and she responds to his message, and she's like, "Welcome home." <laughs> right? and so it's like you you go through the process with the new descendants, you find the same cycle over and over time. They always come and be like, "Wait a minute, I thought I was the only one." And yeah. We all think we're the only small pocket of practice, yeah. and then you start over again. Oh, speaking of these names, people have asked us from time to time. We don't know where the names came from. Um, McNorton. It is a total mystery. Fraction, there are, as far as I know, two versions of the story. Uh, one is that Fraction was a, t a name sometimes given to uh, mixed race individuals. That, and we can't prove that any of the Prestons had sex with the slaves, but I'd be surprised if they didn't. Uh, it was so common. And particularly in the McNaughton family, they were often described in the 19th century as very light skinned. So it wouldn't surprise me. So that's one, that's one definition, of, one story of where Fraction came from. The other, here you tell it better than I do. So the linguistics of the time, Fraction was also used synonymous with the word Fractious. And Fractious means likely to quarrel or likely to fight. So it might have been a label to say watch out for that one, because um, he might give you some trouble. Because they did. Yes, because they did, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it's, it's made it, it's great for me as a historian because if I'm trying to track someone named Smith, it's almost impossible. But tracking fractions and McNaughton's, uh, Moon's not quite as unusual, but fraction and McNaughton, uh, it was relatively, it was easier than it would be for a lot of, a lot of other names. Uh, and just, I guess, to close the story, um, the last individual that I can document was enslaved here uh, was a woman named Ethel McNaughton. She, she remembers McNaughton kind of married a man named Peters. Um, Ethel McNaughton Peters died in West Virginia in 1949. That's the last, it's the last death of the last person I can document was, slipped, was enslaved here. Uh, doesn't mean she was the last, there may have, may have been others. Uh, but that's the last, that, that closes the story. So it begins in 1759, runs to 1949, just shy of two centuries. Right, and that brings it closer, the thing about 1950. Oh yeah, 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 I mean, we, we've met people whose parents were enslaved. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's, slavery was not ancient history. Uh, it, it, it lived until very close to our own time. Um, you've been remarkably patient. Any, any questions that you have, we can answer before we start walking around some. So I guess my question for Kira is, how did you get started in this? So I know for a lot of people that are descendants, you kind of hit a roadblock around 1860s because a lot of the church records are burned. So how do you get past that roadblock? It takes money, first of all, um, because not only, you, first you gotta boost up your membership with Ancestry.com <laughs> and Vogue3 and Newspapers.com, like that's the only thing to Then you have to have money to travel because at a certain point, um, while there are more records that are digitized than what was 30 years ago, yeah. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I definitely wasn't doing research 30 years ago. Um, 30 years ago, but not everything is digitized. So you, you get to a point where you get to the county or the place where you can trace your ancestors being enslaved, and then you have to actually go to that county, to their courts, to their historical societies where those records are, um, if there are any records at all. There are still some organizations, like with the railroad, um, that don't want to share records. Yeah, the Norfolk Southern. Yeah. So that's, that's actually still possible um, in this time that you come across roadblocks. But it's really just piecing together and trying to look at the documents and the history, kind of like the purpose of this walking tour from the point of view of that enslaved person or from your family, because you'll be able to read the information a little bit different and see some clues or some hints that someone else might be, not be able to see. Um, it might be you know some, some family folklore or um, a family member's nickname you know that you know, they, you might find out that your family member, let's say, is from um, 
Blacksburg. Um, and you might find some records and they'd be like, Millie, who used to be from Black Black. And you're like, you know, and you're on your own, you know, nicknames in the African American community is usually representation of something. And so you'd be like, oh, Millie Black Black? But they were in Blacksburg? Really, they were in Blacksburg? And then you can start digging a little bit more. So it takes a lot of patience and a, a lot of investment to do it. And, and you're right about 1860, 1865 is this watershed, partially because, as you said, church records were burned. But the biggest obstacle is simply that there are lots of records that exist for the antebellum years involving slaves, but very few people ever recorded the individual's last names. Mm -hmm. So there are plantation records, there are court records, there are church records, but they often just first name. And the problem is, okay, how can I demonstrate that this John in 1850 is John McNorton in, in, on the 1870 census? Right. That's what is, is such a, a barrier to many people. You have to, to, to do that, you have to look at what's going on at the time. You have to look at roundabout ages. So yep. if John in 1870 is 16, 60 years old and you find a John at a plantation that might be nearby, you know, 20 years earlier, and he's 40 years old, or 42, or 38, you yep. know, like that, that might be the same person. Um, that John is on a plantation with a woman named Ethel, and then 1870 yep. John is in the household with his wife Ethel, and you're yep. like, okay, so that's probably the same person. Yep. Um, or in that 1870 census, John and Ethel have a child named Virginia. Um, and on the plantation, John's sister's name is Virginia, so there's a lot of naming people after family members, and so you gotta kind of piece together things like that. Um, it's hard sometimes. You've seen her dad say a couple of times, like, I'm not sure, but it makes sense, or I'm not, I don't have the document, but I think it makes sense. It's, just a, it's gonna be a lot of that in the process, where you won't be able to say, oh, here's a document that says for sure, but you're saying, with all the evidence, I'm 90% there that that's what that's what always frustrates my, my, my wife likes watching um, um, Lewis Henry Gates finding your roots and I watch it with her time and I have to keep from I have to keep from, from jumping up and screaming at it because he makes everything sound like it's absolute yes. uh, and, and it's not as Kira said a lot of it is okay we've got three or four pieces of circumstantial evidence I'm I would bet money that this is true but can we prove it no it's all it's all a big jigsaw puzzle and uh, another good technique is, um, you know, looking for descendants is not just to, to find family members, but if we can find like cultural practices between Fractions and McNortons who are all living at different places, yeah. then we can kind of track that we all got that habit, that culture, that tradition from the people that were here. And that gives us an opportunity to kind of build the humanity and personalities of the people that were enslaved here instead of limiting, limiting them to work. So one thing, for example, is the reason why we believe that the fracture story is probably it, um, because every pocket has a folklore of like a violent family member, whether <laughs> they're, they're carrying guns, or we got pictures of people like holding with knives. Um, we got the story of uh, Nevada fracture. I don't know if I told you about it. Nevada no, Fraction uh, in Alaska. No. She's a recent discovery. Nevada Fraction in Alaska around the 1950s. Uh -huh. She is living in Alaska, and we only found her because of the Minnesota group. One of um, one of the family members in the Minnesota group is working in Alaska for the federal government, and he goes to the square of Anchorage, Alaska, uh -huh. and there's a plaque there of all the people when Anchorage was basically established as, you know, its own township and city. Yeah. And he just happened to be there and he was like, oh, you know, I'm waiting for someone, just kind of waiting around. Let me look at this statue and this plaque. And he saw the bottom fraction as part of the people that was there. And he was like, who is this? So they called me and I'm like, okay, let's find out from the bottom fraction. This woman is in Anchorage, Alaska. She is, she's working. She keeps getting in trouble with the police. There's this one situation where in the newspaper she's being harassed by a white man, so she shoots him in the face with a flare gun. <laughs> and then a couple of years later, she's in a bar, and a woman comes and the woman starts arguing with her because they're both dating the same man. And the article kind of describes Nevada like 
looking at the woman, and then the woman's like, I'm gonna go home and get my gun and shoot you. And the body's like, okay. So the body goes home to get her gun, the woman goes home to get their gun, they're out in the street, and the body shoots first and kills the woman, and she's on trial. And however, and, and um, Valerie is trying to get the records. She called inquiry and they're looking the court records for her. Because if you read the newspaper article, like the final statement of the judge is, not guilty, the body was just faster. <laughs> and so, you know, so when you go with that type of thing, you're like, no, fractures is probably definitely it. You know, too many, too many shootings of people it's, and too many guns. So. Any other questions we can answer for you? Right. Well, you want to walk around a little bit? Yeah.